Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Tax Policy Center's third annual uh, Donald C. Lubick Symposium. Uh, since I usually forget to say this, let me get the most important piece of business done first. If you are tweeting, uh, you want to join the discussion at hashtag Lubick Symposium. Uh, Lubick Symposium. Uh, what I want to do this morning is tell you a little bit about Don and a little bit about our topic this, this, this uh, morning. My uh, Tax Policy Center colleague, Gene Sterley, posted a very uh, moving blog post. We, do, we don't usually describe tax policy analyses as moving, but um, it was a very moving post on April 6th on the TPC, on TPC's tax vox, uh, telling you more about Don, Don's philosophy, uh, his accomplishments, and why we are so happy to host this event. Uh, I'll summarize very quickly. Legend has it that Don started out as a Republican, but he ended up serving in high positions in every Democratic administration since the Kennedys, uh, including serving as Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy uh, on more than one occasion. One of the great quotes uh, of all time for somebody who's thinking about a career in tax policy. Looking back on his career, Don famously said that each of the times he served was better than the, the, the next one. Uh, uh, we've all had that feeling, I think. Uh, he's worked on tax reform on issues ranging from Buffalo, New York to Eastern Europe. Uh, and one of the things we like best about him is that he's a strong believer in what you might call sensible tax policy. Uh, more efficient, simpler, fairer uh, tax rules, administrable tax rules as well. He's been a steady voice for sensible tax policy for half a century. Uh, and uh, those are commodities that are in short supply uh, right now. So we are honored to be honoring Don, uh, his wife Susan, his daughter Lisa, who are also here, and uh, I think the quality of the people speaking today uh, testifies to Don's accomplishments and his lasting impact uh, on the tax policy world. So Don, thank you for everything you've done, and we hope to maintain uh, those standards. Uh, I guess the saying is, now we move from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, our topic today is the administrative challenges created by last year's tax overhaul. Uh, most of the attention given to the tax overhaul so far is focused on the impact on the size of the economy. Will it grow the economy a lot? Will it pay for itself? Uh, will it boost workers' wages? Who's actually made better off or worse off? Uh, and of course, later this afternoon, CBO will uh, issue its uh, budget estimates of the Tax Act along with everything else that's happened, including the budget deal. Uh, there is no question, though, from an administrative view, uh, the recent Tax Act raises many complex uh, issues. It creates uh, new definitions, it requires new regulations, it generates new uncertainties. The fact that the bill was both comprehensive and passed quickly also means that there are inevitable errors uh, that, and inconsistencies that need to be dealt with. Uh, so from the point of view of taxpayers, uh, we're going to be confused for years. From the point of view of tax planners, the Tax Act is going to be the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, so we're going to talk about these issues today with a variety of tax experts. We look forward to your inputs and questions as well. Uh, having said that, I'll turn it over to my colleague Howard Kalekman, who will run the first panel. Thank you. everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to Don for all the amazing work you did over your career. Um, 
This morning, as Bill said, we're going to be talking about implementation of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That sounds like something only serious tax groups care about. But in reality, the process that follows congressional enactment of legislation is where the rubber meets the road. It's where taxpayers really understand what it is that the law did. Now, no tax bill can answer all the technical issues generated by a change in the law. Uh, and there's some, particular, some special challenges uh, following passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's created major changes in the taxation of multinational corporations, which is an enormously complex corner of the law under the best of circumstances. It's created a new regime for uh, pass-through businesses, such as partnerships and S-corporations. It made important changes in the standard deduction, including capping the state and local tax deduction. It eliminated personal exemption and raised the threshold on the estate tax. All this has driven state governments to confront important issues of conformity. And it did all this in about six weeks. Um, and the, uh, the great speed of enactment uh, increased the likelihood of mistakes and gaps. But any bill, any large bill, uh, is going to have uh, uh, hundreds of questions that are going to have to be answered. Now Treasury and the IRS must address all these issues. On top of that, uh, because the law passed Congress at the end of December and took effect the 1st of January, the agencies must produce this guidance in a very short period of time. So how will Treasury and the IRS implement the new tax law? How will the process work over the next few years? To help answer those questions, we have four of our nation's top tax experts. They've all had vast experience uh, either on Capitol Hill or in the administration or in several cases, both. Uh, Barbara Angus is the chief tax counsel of the House Ways and Means Committee. She also served as international tax counsel for Treasury's Office of Tax Policy. Uh, Lily Batchelder is the Stokes professor of law at NYU. She served as deputy director of the National Economic Council in the Obama administration and as chief democratic tax counsel for the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, Marty Sullivan uh, is chief economist and contributing editor at Tax Analyst. He previously was a staff economist at Treasury and the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation. And Dana Trier served as Deputy Assistant Treasury Secretary for Tax Policy during consideration of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and immediately after its passage. He's currently counsel at the law firm of Davis Polk. So let me start by asking Barbara to briefly describe the implementation process going forward. How does all this work? Sure, thank you. I'm going to take just a minute to, uh, to give a, uh, the typical uh, Hill staff disclaimer uh, that my comments are, uh, are my own and I'm not speaking uh, officially on behalf of the chairman or the committee. Uh, and then I also, if you'll indulge me, want to take a minute to say how much I appreciate the opportunity to be here at the third annual Don Lubig seminar. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to have been invited to be at the first one um, as well. Uh, and uh, was very privileged to have an opportunity to work with Don Lubick uh, in his most recent stint at the Treasury Department, uh, both when I was on the staff of the, of the um, Joint Committee and we worked um, together uh, with Treasury on the 97 Act, uh, and then subsequently uh, when uh, I was in the, in the private sector and came before Don and his colleagues as a, as a stakeholder. Uh, and uh, so I think maybe that's part of part of why I was um, so eager to accept a second invitation to appear at this conference. Um, um, and also, uh, I share a heritage from Buffalo, uh, where, I, where I was born and raised. Uh, and they make hardy stock in Buffalo. <laughs> um, in terms of um, the, the the question of uh, of uh, implementation, certainly a, a really important question. Um, some one that I think sometimes people lose sight of that. Um, legislation is only is only a part of the tax law, and if you think about it in terms of volume, it is only a small part of the tax law. I just we just got our new tax codes, um, um, and I have a nice, very thick one volume tax code. We also got our new set of regulations, uh, and I have a stack of eight volumes of uh, of uh, tax regulations. Now, to be fair, another pub publisher publishes them in six volumes, um, <laughs> but they're uh, the the when you think about uh, what may be a paragraph or half a page of legislative text, that often can support. Um, um, tens or a hundred pages or more of, of regulations. So really important part of the process. Uh, and uh, I think as we were working on the legislation, um, which um, was many years in the, in the, in the making, 
uh, in the sense that there are concepts in this legislation, big principles in this legislation, that date back to, say, the, camp, the first version of the camp draft in 2011, um, other ideas that, 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 date, uh, that date farther back. Uh, as as uh, on the Hill, as we developed the legislation, it was really important to include uh, folks from the Treasury Department and the Office of, of Tax Policy as part of the, the drafting work um, because um, a very important voice to have um, in the discussions, but also recognizing that um, their participation in that process would be very valuable as they worked uh, as they worked on the guidance to come. And I guess the last thing I would comment on is that guidance comes in in a variety of different forms. There's the work of the Treasury Department on regulations and on guidance in other forms, notices, revenue rulings. A variety of different forms can be used uh, depending on the particular purpose. Uh, we also will have more guidance um, to come in the form of the Joint Committee on Taxation's Blue Book uh, that will um, collect the legislative history of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the act uh, and also provide some further color. Uh, Tom Barthold has talked about one of the things that they're looking to do in the, in the Blue Book is to provide some more examples than were provided in the legislative history. And then another important part of the process is... Uh, um, is the technical corrections process, something that happens with any piece of major legislation. And all three of those processes, the Treasury guidance process, the Blue Book, and, the, and technical corrections sort of work together in that um, work on one can, uh, can um, provide information that leads to a decision to put something in the Blue Book or to put something on the technical correction list and vice versa. So, Dana, this um, this process has sort of grown up informally. Can you talk to us a little bit about how this has happened, how this has evolved over, over time? Uh, I, it, the process that Barbara speaks of is actually goes back a long way. Uh, Marty and I both brought our 86 Act uh, Blue Book, and I think that um, sort of inevitably... <laughs> I know a little bit more about it than he does. <laughs> He's an economist. You have to remember this. But it goes back quite a long, long way. Really, my first blue book that I mastered was the 76 Act blue book, uh, which um, you know, uh, goes back quite a bit. The 78 Act blue book I, I, I learned. And uh, what I would emphasize about it is two things. Formally... As Barbara says, um, they all are related. So that one of the things, it's just like writing an article or doing a structure on a deal or anything. Once you, once you start to implement, you see issues that you did not see when, when you were, uh, once you start to write or once you start to do regs or once all the American sectors of the economy, sectors of the American economy come in and talk to you, you start to see issues. And those issues can, are now in the lap of Treasury, unlike what the situation was up to, uh, until the end of the last year, Treasury and IRS will be the principal work doers. But there's a feedback uh, that is occurring every day, every week, et cetera. And that feedback will partly occur uh, through the technical corrections and blue book process. Um, uh, as Barbara said, we, we all know from the old days, if you look at the 86 Act blue book, it has 202, by my account, um, footnotes that say a technical correction may be necessary. So the technical corrections process is related to the blue book process, which in turn is related to the uh, to the reg pro uh, process. So just as Treasury and IRS are doing their work, they're going to be talking and consulting with their colleagues with whom they worked uh, during the legislative process on all this. And the other thing I would add is that uh, it, it's not all formal. Uh, it would be odd for a Treasury person um, or an IRS person not to want to know what Barbara and her colleagues thought about an issue. Why did you decide not to put uh, this provision in? Why did you do that? 
They're tax professionals. You always want to listen to what other tax professionals say. So this process is formally going to be reflected in technical corrections and, and the blue book, uh, but there's also a broader formal, informal process that will go on over not just the months ahead, but, but quite a long time. So, Lily, that raises an interesting issue. I, I mentioned at the beginning that the timing of this was kind of challenging because the, the law was effective so quickly after enactment. So how important is speed? How, how do, how do the, the, the reg writers balance the need to get guidance out quickly with the need to get it right? Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, this was a bill that was passed inordinately quickly. Um, it was uh, from the date of first introduction to the date of final passage, it was 50 days. And if you compare that to Obamacare, it was nine months. So uh, this was an incredibly rushed process, and I think as a result, this means that there's going to be um, a huge amount of technical issues in the bill. Uh, this is not at all a knock on any staff. I think they did an extraordinary job under a very tight timeline given to them by their bosses, but it's just a fact of life that this is a bill with huge fundamental consequences, um, and there's going to be a lot of things that staff simply couldn't have thought through during the process. Um, and as Barbara said, there are pieces of the bill that date back to other discussion drafts, but there's also big pieces that had never seen the light of day until 50 days before enactment. Um, so I think what this means is um, that in interpreting uh, the bill, and there is always a major role for Treasury and IRS in interpreting any uh, legislation, um, their role is even bigger in this process, much, much bigger, and has potentially very large revenue consequences. Um, so uh, in my view, the best approach would be for Treasury to act and the IRS very quickly in issuing a first tranche of guidance that uh, may not cover the waterfront, um, but uh, interprets the bill, advances broad principles in ways that protect the FISC. Um, there is going to be a huge push among all of the brilliant tax lawyers in the country to identify ways to reduce their tax bills that may or may not be have been intended by the bill. Going to be. Right? Is, yes. <laughs> um, are. And so I think it's really important that Treasury gets out um, very quickly guidance that you know maybe initially takes a more conservative approach with respect to protecting the FISC, and then over time develops a more nuanced approach as they deem appropriate. Um, but if they don't do so, it's going to be open season. And it's not going to be all taxpayers that um, have open season. It's going to be the ones that can afford really expensive, um, very sophisticated tax advice that will get advice on strategies that potentially um, comply with the letter of the law, but not the intention. And so, um, so my first piece of advice, uh, if, if I was able to give it to IRS and Treasury, would be to take that approach. Uh, the second would be to do it in the sunshine. So having um, worked in both the Hill and the executive branch, the overwhelming number of people that request meetings, um, whether it's for legislation or regulatory guidance, are uh, uh, representing or employed by very large corporations and very wealthy individuals. And you barely ever get a meeting request from someone who has no skin in the game. Um, so I think it's going to be really important for um, Treasury and IRS to be proactive in trying to solicit uh, advice on how to interpret the law from people that don't have skin in the game. That might be retired practitioners. That might be practitioners who don't have a client interest. That might be academics. Um, and do that you know, in public fora so that the people that have skin in the game and have a very strong client interest are, um, need to debate what they're advancing with people that don't. So, Lily, this seems like there's a little tension in what you're saying, though. So the more you're engaging more people, the slower the process. So how do you, how do you balance the need to be transparent with the need to be fast? I think, again, you sort of first put out broad principles um, of anti-abuse, um, take relatively conservative interpretations, but say you're, you know, this is initial guidance and there's going to be a notice and comment rulemaking process. And then over time, if, if it's considered appropriate, develop some more nuanced guidance. But you don't have to you know, get to the finish line um, right away. You can issue guidance that's sort of progressively, and this is always the case, the notice and comment, it's meant to evolve over time. Um, but you can also issue different kinds of guidance that are not proposed regulations and as I think well. we, see, we see Treasury doing that already 
uh, very much focused on the need to prioritize the questions that are the most urgent, um, the ones that they've got the sort of ability to, to answer, even though they're not, not answering everything in a particular area, and, and also the form that they use to put out guidance. So we saw notices come out, um, uh, a, f a handful of notices came out before the end of the year, notices have come out uh, um, since then, it is an iterative process, uh, and a notice um, gives, um, in some ways, it's an extra step in the process, um, in the transparent, transparent process that you talk about, uh, because it announces that, that regulations will be put out that will, that will provide this guidance, so there is an extra step for uh, opportunity for, for folks to comment. Uh, I think it is, there, there are lots of questions that are... Um, that, that people um, are very much seeking um, guidance on. And so, so Treasury is balancing um, the, the, the resources and the questions that, that affect financial, statement, um, financial statements. That was a focus um, at the end of the year or the very beginning of the year. And I think we'll see Treasury continuing to do that. Um, certainly there is a focus on um, identifying areas where someone... Um, um, we could view uh, stakeholders as potentially taking advantage, and Treasury wants to get guidance out that makes clear um, um, to uh, close off any of those avenues. Uh, but I don't think that we should discount the the um, importance and maybe the prevalence of the of um, the role of guidance in answering questions, in applying uh, principles that are in the tax law to very specific fact patterns or to circumstances and that are ordinary not the, business, right? That are not <laughs> the usual. That, mm -hmm. that may not be the mm -hmm. the sort of broad, um, uh, uh, but a but a narrower set of circumstances. Um, I, I, I believe that many of the people that are seeking that are seeking guidance are seeking answers to questions, uh, and so um, I don't think that it is. Um, uh, we should think about the guidance process as a rush to cut off uh, potential inappropriate behavior, uh, but 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 really the guidance process very much is about um, ensuring that the that the people have the answers that they need. Well. Can I go to Lily's point on transparency? Congress is notorious for being secretive when they're developing these policies. And I think especially in this informal process where there's no formal procedures, that they really have to take conscientious steps to be more open. So we, people come in and there are all these meetings and there's all this discussion, but none of it's in public. We don't know who's meeting with whom. We don't know who's representing Congress. We don't know who's representing Treasury. We have no record of the Treasury meetings. We have no record of the congressional meetings. So I think, uh, and there's billions and billions of dollars on the line. I can name three or four provisions that are billion dollar issues uh, that are gonna be in the regulations. And I think, uh, you know, on the trade off between speed and transparency, I think uh, transparency gets not too much attention and I think that's really would be helpful if that would change. So Dana, you've been in the trenches very recently on this. What do you think about this idea of more transparency in the regulatory well, process? Well, I think you have, <laughs> I think one has a big issue with transparency. I think that it's, it's difficult before the, as I know very well, uh, it's very difficult for Treasury before guidance comes out to talk about it um, in public, it's just uh, just a fact. It's partly um, just the nature of the discussion, but it's also partly because uh, you know things will be mangled inevitably uh, in the press discussion, et cetera. So I think that to a large extent, what what um, what's being relied on here, I don't think is something where where it's going to be at all possible on February. Uh, on uh, May 1st for a Treasury person to get up and say, we've talked to the following 10 groups and this is what we're thinking about. I think what we're ultimately relying on is the proposed regulation process, the process where you're going to promulgate regs. So Barbara, and get comments. And get comments, have a full airing, have uh, the Lee Shepherds of the world who, who have taught themselves a lot of tax, and, 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 and uh, I put Marty and Howard in, in this, saying, oh, those proposed regs will permit this or that group 
uh, to do things that uh, that were not anticipated by the, uh, by the uh, legislation. My, Barbara said much of what I was going to say. I think if you go back a little to your basic point, there is no possibility of providing early guidance on all this legislation. So the very first thing Treasury and IRS did is the PGP, and to decide which... Could you just say what PGP is? The, the priority guidance plan. So the priority guidance plan is, is in effect, um, the, what we used to call the business plan. I and mean, in Eric's day, I think you would call it the business plan. Eric was, uh, among other things, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Regulatory Affairs. And it has a June 30th fiscal year. So the very first thing Treasury decided and IRS decided, working with Bill Paul at the IRS, is which of these provisions, when, are we going to be promulgating early guidance on? And then, sort of backing that up, early guidance really means midsummer, and they may not make it until late summer as a, as a factual matter, then what comes next? So, for example, uh, going back to Barbara's point, the the transition tax notices, because of the reporting effect and because, speaking of becoming immediately effective, some of that law is effective before the year, uh, had to be done first. So there was, as you know, a notice before January 1st that was issued. And the, uh, I, the international people from Treasury had to focus on that. There's just no question. And that's inconsistent with doing things like uh, uh, the guilty, the other international attribute, uh, attributes of the international regime. So um, pass-throughs is on the early guidance. There's three components to the pass-throughs guidance. Carried interest, which is a less central aspect of the legislation, whatever you think of, of that provision, it's less central. That's not on the early guidance. And the very, so to, to fulfill Lilly's objectives, the very first thing they have to do is prioritize. And triage. Mm -hmm, triage. But, it, but it's interesting. So, so one of the, I, probably the first example of guidance mm -hmm. was uh, this issue involving prepayment of property taxes. Mm -hmm. so there that was, was on the IRS side, though. Right, right, right. right. But there was, a, there was a hard deadline, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people had to mm -hmm. know the yeah. answer by December 31st or mm -hmm. January 1st. And the IRS just dropped it. I mean, they just did it. There was, there was no discussion as far as I know with anybody. They just said, this is what we think. And it was an enormously controversial decision. People are still arguing about whether the service was right about it. Sure. So, so I, I think that. So, I, I, what do you do when you when you have this this you've got these hard deadlines, you've got this need for transparency, you have all these advocates who all want to be heard. Um, how do you balance all that? I don't well, know. I think the process is really. I, I think the the process that has been in place for many many years. Um, long tradition at the at the Office of Tax Policy, um, I think is is built for this for this kind of situation and for building transparency into it. So I think Dana is exactly right. The business plan I can't get used to PGP. <laughs> uh, the business plan is for first indication of uh, of plans to issue guidance in an area. That's an invitation for stakeholders to send comments in uh, about what that guidance should or shouldn't say. Uh, and many stakeholders take that opportunity, um, both those who who represent uh, who, who represent companies, those who represent trade associations, the various bar associations, all sorts of different stakeholders will 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 submit uh, comments there, which is a transparent process. Then then one could imagine that the regulations that will come out won't be. A, a regulation, the first proposed regulation, wouldn't be some wouldn't always be something that goes from beginning to end. When you look at the kinds of guidance that was issued that were issued after the eighty six Act, I remember spending an awful lot of time with some regs that were in Q and A form um, because it's a, <laughs> a golden parachute. I, I, it was, I was a very young associate. Mm -hmm. I remember those regs, but they were very useful. It was an efficient way to answer some questions. Um, and I would expect that uh, that the that the Treasury Department will use all those different avenues to get information out to then solicit more comments through that back and forth let, process. Let, let me give let me give two examples of this concretely. If you, one of the big issues, which of course uh, 
people here have written about, is going to be uh, describing the, the specified service, trade, or business. Um, Marty, I forgot to put in a plug. Marty's got a very good piece this morning in tax notes about yeah. 12 ways people it's can 12, gain 12 this. different ways. <laughs> it, it is, first of all, I can say this now, that's going to be a thankless task to specify that. But there is actually just no choice but for Treasury to do the best it can, and Treasury and IRS, get out proposed regs, have a very wide in, in discussion. Uh, part of what's going on when you think about that is that uh, if anybody that's ever been in Treasury sort of realizes that the country is much more, is unbelievably complex. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and you will affect a number of things. Just so folks know what we're talking about, the, reg, uh, the, the statute says that you, would, you will not qualify for no. the pass-through deduction or, or certain parts of the pass-through deduction if you are a business whose principal assets are the reputation or skills of the owners or employees. And I posit to you that the Treasury has to define what principal means, what asset means, what reputation means, and what skills means uh, to make this work. Well, what, what they have to do, as much as anything, is, to, is determine what the role of that provision is vis-a-vis -vis other specific uh, things. Yeah, we should, perhaps it would be appropriate to talk about what the entire statute says, since it gives a list of things that are specified services, and that's the, and that's the catch-all at the end, it's also not new language. It's language that's been in the code for a long time, something that, uh, that um, I think is, is often used as things are reformed in the tax code to see if you're putting, when you're putting a new rule in, um, a natural tendency of the drafters and of policymakers is to look to existing rules because then you can bring, bring um, any existing learning or understanding of, uh, of, those, uh, of those rules that, that that this is an example of a of a provision that uh, um, that came from from existing law, the wage limitation uh, that is part of the the uh, um, um, pass through provision also came from um, old section one ninety nine uh, where there was where there was some guidance. So again, it does that doesn't um, uh, eliminate um, the need for I, Treasury actually, to address these things. Actually, it brings home the point. Uh, Barbara, you're referring to Section 1202, so it existed in prior law. It's been in law, I can't remember, 10, 15 years. And an antecedent of it, 448. Right. But there still is no clarification. That, that, that provision was rarely, rarely used, and mm -hmm. that actually proves the point. There's been no clarification of what those words mean mm -hmm. to this day. So even though it's been in the, in the uh, statute for, I don't know, how many years, we've gotten very minimal guidance, just some technical advice memoranda and private letter rulings and, and so part forth. Of, part of what I'm suggesting is, let's say it's this issue, I mean, we could mm -hmm. list 50 different issues that are like this, where there's, you know, some history but a lot of lack of clarity. Um, it might be the case that after 10 years, Treasury and IRS are going to figure out that the appropriate approach in 100 borderline cases is 20 of them are allowed to claim the pass-through deduction and 80 don't, aren't. And right now, it's crystal clear that two should be able to. I'm saying, right now, put out guidance saying two should be able to. No, and we're going to figure out whether the other 18 should over time. It, it, but if you don't do that, then you're going to have all 100 claiming right now. And these are generally going to be the most sophisticated, large, wealthy individuals and corporations claiming the deduction when it's really not appropriate. So, guidance is an iterative process. Exactly. I think it, it, yeah. it, is, it, it always has been. And so there are, when you look at, at sort of any area, there's areas of the law that haven't changed from a statutory perspective, sort of over many years never changed, but there were iter iterative regulations. Um, that's one of the values to having important things addressed in regulation um, because there's the ability to adapt to developments in the economy, to changes in technology, to all sorts of changes things. Changes in tax planning. You know, that you didn't perceive at the end. I, I think, uh, I don't think anybody at Treasury and IRS would disagree with you, Lily. The thing that you have to be careful about, though, it just depends on, on the provision. I'm going to take 163J, which is the limit on the interest deduction. We won't go into the, the fine topic. So we now have a notice. The notice covers 
like five topics. It is, there are a large number of other little topics out there. I guarantee you the people at the Treasury and IRS know 95% of those topics. They know it by seeing the panels. They know it from their private experience, etc. But one of the things that you always learn the hard way is, is that if you answer until you understand the gestalt, until you understand how it all fits together, it's very dangerous to, um, to answer right out of the blue one of, those, one of those issues. In the case of the transition tax uh, issues, the, this is the repatriation, the deemed repatriation that occurred, Treasury had no choice. It really, Treasury and IRS had to answer many of those questions in the notice format early. But that's actually a pretty uncomfortable situation because they're, they're answering those questions before they've done a comprehensive proposed reg package as, as to which uh, the way everything fits together is clear. So there's, there's tensions here. I think on the, on the, on the pass-through thing, they know it's important to get there early. Early for them will mean late summer. It won't satisfy uh, your greatest desires. And everybody knows that what they issue will not be the last word. But it has to be issued in order to get the dialogue started. And that's part of the iterative process that, that Barbara discussed. Let me ask, let me ask each of you. I, I, I did a, a blog post last week about this, and Lily has alluded to it. And it's this issue of um, how taxpayers respond to this uncertainty. And in the blog post I wrote, I, I had talked to a couple of practitioners who were very worried about what, what mm -hmm. the race to the bottom, that you're going to get very aggressive taxpayers and very aggressive practitioners who, who are going to push the envelope and maybe push beyond the red line. Uh, and, and that by the time Treasury catches up to this, it's going to be years, and they will have at I, worst had... No, and, and I, just, I just wanted to get your response to how much of a concern <laughs> that is. Uh, uh, let, let's start with Barbara and kind of go down the... <laughs> well, well cer certainly there are always um, people who take aggressive positions. Particularly the economists. true of old, <laughs> of old law and new law. Um, I, I, I am a firm believer that most taxpayers want to comply with the law. Uh, and so they're looking to, uh, to make interpretations uh, it, based on um, the, the, the law and, the, and the, the legislative history, sort of all of the tools that are at their disposal. That's why they're asking questions, because they want more guidance to provide more certainty. Um, but but I, I'm a believer in the system. Mm -hmm. Lily, how about you? I, I think this is an enormously important issue. I, again, I think in, to a large extent because of the speed in which this bill was enacted, um, the revenue consequences of guidance and regulation are going to be much larger than we've seen at any time in, uh, well, in my tax history. Um, so, uh, so what I think that means is that, um, again, Treasury and IRS need to be taking relatively conservative, quick positions and then considering whether to loosen them over time. So, you know, we saw a recent article in the Wall Street Journal about crack and pack strategies with the pass-through deduction and that businesses are going to split their, you know, clearly services income into a separate business from their less clearly services income so they can claim the pass-through deduction on that or they're going to put them together so that overall it's considered eligible for the deduction. I think that's an area where Treasury and IRS should take a pretty um, aggressive anti-abuse stance, that a lot of this is not going to work. And then over time, what that will do is mean that people aren't going to incur a huge amount of planning costs when they're not clear that they work. Um, they're just going to interpret it more conservatively initially. And then over time, Treasury can say, OK, in this situation, we think that strategy really does work. That was intended by Congress. But take a sort of first cut that um, weighs the fisc more heavily, which has the added advantage of not um, creating opportunities for the taxpayers that can afford the most sophisticated tax advice to um, be aggressive and people who cannot not be aware of those strategies. Marty, how about you? How worried are you are about, about this? The, uh, I just want to take a step uh, back. The, 
the 600 pound gorilla in the room is the 21% corporate tax rate. And uh, all the practitioners I've been talking to are, uh, uh, it's all everything, you know, wait and see. We gotta wait and see. We don't know what to do. We don't, the, the critical decision about whether to become a pass through or to become a C corporation, which was always difficult, has now just been made exponentially more difficult. So under, if you want to be a pass-through, of course, you're only subject to one level of tax and potentially to the pass-through deduction. That's good. If you want to be a corporation... Let's say it's 29.6. Thank you. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And um, just, to, just to illustrate what you're... No, no, 20, versus 21. Versus 21. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's a host of other things, yeah. like non-tax and non-tax issues. Mm -hmm. And what the business community is doing is they don't, well, we're not, and also because it's going to expire, mm -hmm. the, the pass-through deduction is scheduled to expire mm -hmm. at the end of 2025, why should I change my business form until I have the regulations? So contrary to uh, people... Howard's article. People doing tax planning before the regulations coming mm -hmm. out, they're waiting for the regulations to come out so they have some certainty mm -hmm. on how to proceed. Now, whether you want to call it tax planning or, you know, the, the negative connotation, uh, you say uh, people are trying to comply and they just don't know what to do. Let, let me just add one thing. I, I, I did read uh, your piece, Howard. The, uh, the, I actually think, in my world at least, uh, the world is what Marty is describing. In other words, in other words and, and it's affected by the Wall Street Journal article. So I happen to have a conference call with a client the day of the Wall Street Journal article, and I expressed my concern uh, this is maybe what Lily is asking for, but I said, in your situation, given those articles, even though your facts are quite robust, there will be an impetus, there uh, potentially will be an impetus for the Treasury and the IRS to exercise what reg authority they have in the most conservative, and I'll call it blunt, I don't like the word conservative, but in the most blunt way, without without reverence, uh, uh, reference to nuanced facts. So that, in fact, what I see is instead of a rush to the uh, bottom, now this may be the kind of people that would call me or call Davis Polk, uh, but what I see is in, instead a, a uh, concern of moving forward on, on uh, crack and pack and all that kind of thing. But even, you know, even... Um, uh, a concern that their existing arrangements, which happen to involve multiple entities, and which happen to involve entities, some of which would qualify for the uh, pass-throughs deduction and some of which not, they're worried that there would be a global aggregation uh, rule that would affect that. So I think that, you know, this is going to be a very, very tricky reg for the and, uh, for the, tr uh, the IRS, there is no question. Significant of it. change in the in the law. The twenty one percent is a significant. Twenty one percent is a significant. Mm. It's a significant change. It has significant implications internationally mm -hmm. um, to have a have a rate that is more in line with the mm -hmm. with the rest of the world. Um, it, the, the 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 providing a new regime for for pass throughs. Um, to provide um, uh, a d to maintain more of a level playing field between the pass through form and the corporate form was an important objective in in tax reform. Um, when you look back at the eighty six act that had dramatic implications um, um, for the for for choice of entity um, and a um, huge amount of activity yes. between eighty six and, and eighty eight or, or, or there were a tremendous number of sub S elections. There were a tremendous number of spin offs where one corporation would make an S election and one corporation would not. Uh, my friend Lou Freeman uh, wrote an article for the University of Chicago Tax, I think in 1987, uh, referring to the phenomenon as the methodical disincorporation of America. Uh, whenever these core mm -hmm. uh, tax rates and the balance among them changes, there's going to be planning. And they're going, to, I, I use the more, uh, I called planning that, you know, Eric and I and people, people like us is do. Is it planning or is it, or is it, or is it, it's, it's also an opportunity. And I was on a panel recently where someone t expressed concern about the fact that it used to be very clear if you started a business, mm -hmm. you knew how you wanted to structure that business. And now there are these new options 
Um, I, I think that one, one ought to look at that in some ways, um, importantly, as, as more opportunities, as more flexibility to be able to choose the form that makes sense for the business instead of tax driving the form. So after the 86 Act, there was a, there was a significant disincorporation. The, the pass that was a good thing. The pass-through format is not always the easiest format mm-hmm. to, to, mm-hmm. Uh, uh, to conduct business in. It creates complexity. You've got businesses that have huge compliance departments because they're issuing um, so many K-1s. Um, for some of those businesses, the more natural business form, if the tax law didn't, didn't, hadn't put a, a thumb on the scale, might well be a, be a corporation. We now have a situation where some businesses can think about, about becoming a C-corporation with a, with a 21% rate. I think that, 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 that those are, that's planning that people should be thinking about doing. I'm thinking uh, about becoming a C-corporation. So, Marty, what, <laughs> what, while, you're, while you're thinking I about I was that. a C-corporation at one time. <laughs> Dana L. Trier, PC. I was a chairman of the board. <laughs> Marty, let me ask you, let me ask you an economist. <laughs> what happened? Marty, I want to ask you an economist question. This is your big chance. You're surrounded by lawyers. Um, so if you and Dana are right, and the, and the big issue is not the race to the bottom, but the big problem here is that people are slowing down their decision-making. Yeah. So Kevin Hassett's argued the other day that the, 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 the regulatory issues will have no effect on his economic growth projections. Um, sounds like from what you're saying that uh, it may. So tell me what you think about that. Well, I think we have this tax bill has a lot of good features, the lower rate, expensing, tightening up on interest deductions, a lot of fe- territory. There's just a tremendous number of excellent features. But one thing it does have also is incredible uncertainty and incredible administrative costs. And uh, it's due to the... Uh, the, the sources of, and of course, uncertainty is what businesses hate most, especially when they're doing long-term planning. Now, the uncertainty is a product of hasty, uh, the, the legislation was crafted very quickly. It was done in a partisan manner. Now, that doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, uh, the, 2000, uh, sorry, the 1993 Clinton tax increases were partisan. Uh, but it just means it's unstable. If there is a change in power in 2018, 2020, you have to take that into account as a possibility. I'm not predicting or you know, forecasting or anything, but that's uh, people have a real concern: is the rate still going to be 25? Is it still going to be 21 percent in 2020? And then people you have, are making a guess, actually. As to, they think they usually say, "We'll assume it's going to be 25." Yeah, mm-hmm. just to be safe. Mm-hmm. Now, the other problem, even if you don't have a change in power, is you have unprecedented high levels of federal debt. When uh, George Bush did his tax cuts in 2001. We were headed to zero federal debt. We are now at 77 percent and going that way. And the numbers are going to come out at two o'clock today. Everybody should uh, take a look at it. And then there's the built-in instability of the law, which is the expiring provisions. So there's a lot of uncertainty hanging over this, and that detracts from all of the benefits that are in the bill. And if somehow we could remove that uncertainty, that would make the bill better. So, Barbara, I have to give you a chance to respond. I suspect you've got... Well, I, I thank you for your comments about the, uh, about the bill. There, there are a lot of significant, um, significant advances in the bill. It's also the biggest reform that we've had in many years. Um, yes, there were lots of bills between the 86 Act and, uh, um, and, and this bill, um, but I don't think that there was one of this magnitude. And so um, I, I had in, previously in my career, I had, the, I had the opportunity to work on um, regulations related to legislation that I worked on a couple of times um, when I went to Treasury after having been on the Joint Committee staff um, and, uh, and then working on some legislation while I was at Treasury and, and, the, and, then, the, and then the regulations. And it's a, it's a, it's a big and important job um, and it's one that needs to be approached with um, with great care. And for a bill like the 86 Act, for a bill like this, it's a multi-pronged job. Um, so it involves not just one one area, but many areas. Uh, so for the Office of Tax Policy, it'll be all hands uh, uh, working on it. 
I think there are um, the more certainty that, that, that can be provided through, through guidance, through the blue book, um, through technical corrections, the better. Um, Chairman Brady also has said since the beginning of the year that uh, he views uh, himself and the committee as in, as in receive mode uh, for, for those who want to come in and talk about any of those issues as well as, uh, as um, stakeholders who want to come in and talk about further refinements that can be made. Uh, certainly addressing the, uh, the temporary aspects of the bill is a, is a, is a key thing. Uh, many want to see those provisions made, made permanent to provide just the certainty that Marty is talking about um, and I'm certainly willing to, to, uh, uh, to hear about other refinements that people um, believe could be made um, that would further the objectives uh, underlying the bill. So that would be a second bill? A second, a second, uh, not a technical correction. Yeah, that, that, I think it's an important distinction, right? right. So there's, there's two things on the table, a second bill and a technical correction right. bill. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to push back a bit on the notion that there's no race to the bottom that's going on or going to happen. Um, Thank you, Lily. I, I, I think there you know, are definitely people that receive advice, as, as Dana's suggesting, that you know, there's so much uncertainty, you shouldn't take an aggressive position right now. Um, there are taxpayers that care about the reputational effects of if they are found to have been too aggressive tax-wise. There's also a lot who just don't want to adjust their earnings for uh, if they're subsequently told that they took too aggressive a tax position. Uh, but there are a lot of taxpayers that do not get Dana's advice and that care more about the expected value of taxes they pay. And so if there is the possibility of an aggressive tax position, they're not sure they're going to be audited. Um, they're not sure whether they will prevail or not. Mm -hmm. The worst they're going to, yeah, that's going to happen is they'll pay penalties. Um, those taxpayers have huge incentive to go for that race to the bottom unless and until um, there is guidance that says, you know, we're closing the door. We may, you know, open it a bit for you later on. But right now we're taking this well, blunt approach and saying that um, this kind of strategy well, is probably in, not going to work. In the Wall Street Journal article, they were quoting some Dallas attorney. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to split my law firm into four mm -hmm. lawyers, which will not be qualified. I would under say that was a dumb guy to say that. I was going to say that. <laughs> and he was going to split the other part into the administrative portion which would be eligible for the past reduction. Yeah. And I had the same reaction, which was that's very... And, and Marty, is that particular, that particular aspect of the article that bothered me as, as a tax planner, because if you see that kind of disaggregation, as I call it, you call, call, professors call it cracking, I don't know, the, the, uh, uh, then there's more likely to be a more blunt reaction to it which would affect the kind of things that I'm being exposed to, which are actually quite nuanced and in, in several cases pre-existing. And, you know, they're pre-existing uh, relationships. So just go to the PGP. We're sorry for the term of art. Mm -hmm. There's three, three uh, pass-through reg projects. One of them is anti-abuse. The, I always gave the, the, you know, the potted plant speech when I was at Treasury. The people that are writing this, these articles about being concerned about the abuse, are assuming that you have, you know, a bunch of nerds in Treasury that are not, <laughs> um, not responsive to the kind of planning that they they understand before they got the Treasury. I mean, you know, we, the, the people who are in Treasury have done. Uh, up sea structures, multi entity structures, their entire career. They're they, very cool. They're not nerds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about them being, but, but, but you're assuming no treasury response. Um, so, do they think that, does the Dallas attorney think that the, the treasury um, and the Hill doesn't read? The, the yeah, I mean, <laughs> no. uh, 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 the but right, thing. right from the uh, right from the beginning, though, on multiple different things that people say, yeah. You know, uh, people will say, "Well, this is illegal," but of course, the IRS doesn't have enough funds. I mean, I don't, I don't know that you can assume widespread illegal conduct, like declaring your in Dan's article, there's declaring yourself an independent contractor. I don't know that uh, that's going to work out well for the employees of Davis Polk, for them to wake up and uh, declare themselves independent contractors. So, uh, you know, I think Treasury has a big issue. Uh, with respect to the regs, I actually think the issue is 
more subtle, and which is the subtle question of what should be permitted even conceptually, as opposed, I don't think anybody would think that the, the Dallas law firm with the bookkeeping uh, should be uh, uh, permitted. And the, you know, and the question is, how do you frame regulations that deal with that without uh, dealing with other? So uh, let, me, let me raise a, a couple of other issues. First one I want to talk about is, uh, the, and, and Barbara alluded to it when she talked about a, a, a possibly a second tax bill. Uh, Chairman Hatch has been quite explicit. He, he did it at a tax policy center event. He's done it at hearings. Quite explicit that where there is uncertainty, it's not Treasury's responsibility to clarify it. It's Congress's responsibility. You didn't quite say that, but... Well, okay. What was your interpretation of what he said? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And explain what was it. Hey, he did say in his... Uh, uh, I'm referring to his letter, actually. His letter said yeah. the best... What, what the chairman said was, quote, where there are potentially unclear... Where things are potentially unclear in the TCJAA, Congress should be the one to determine and explain what was intended. It's pretty, it, to me, that sounds pretty explicit. So, um, Lily, what, what, what's your take on that? And where does that leave us in this process of trying to get regulations out relatively Senate quickly? Yeah. Lily, explain this. I, I don't think that's... <laughs> you used to work in the Senate. Explain that. <laughs> I, I don't think that is generally the case. Uh, I mean, there certainly are when you, you draft and pass legislation um, things that are not... Uh, you know, totally clear in the statute, and there's colloquies on the floor, and there's legislative history that exists um, saying this is what we mean, this portion to be interpreted, and I think that's something legitimate that should really be taken into account um, uh, in the guidance. But if Congress was silent, I don't think Congress can just uh, announce this is how we think it should be interpreted without passing new le legislation. So, um, sure, yeah. Congress can pass some new legislation, but I don't think ex post... Um, they can say this is what we intended without some record of that happening before the bill was passed. It's important to think about that for a second, because of course you want to consult with Congress uh, and what, the, what they thought about. But who are you speaking to in Congress? Are you speaking to a staff member? Are you speaking to one member? Are you speaking to the majority? I mean, the only way Congress really can speak formally is by passing legislation. And so until they pass legislation, I mean, we want to... Well, they, they also do the legislative history. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And that ultimately comes down to statutory, what we haven't talked about yet. Ultimately, this is all, uh, well, there's a big circle around it by the courts. The courts are going to ultimately decide, and statutory interpretation, and I'm the only economist up here, uh, but the uh, only lawyer. Uh, but you've the, gotten way beyond your economics. No, but, thing. I mean, but if you read. You're doing you stuff read, on interest allocation. You, you, re, you read half an article about uh, statutory interpretation and you realize it's totally an arbitrary area. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is ultimately all a haze. Uh, because if. And it's interesting to notice one thing. If the Treasury takes a taxpayer favorable position in a regulation, it'll never be challenged in court. It just goes away. And so life is easier for everybody. If, on the other hand, Treasury takes an aggressive stand where the statute may be ambiguous, you're going to have court challenges. And it goes to court, and, we're going to, and then you're going to have statutory interpretation, which is going to be very arbitrary. So there's an asymmetry here. Uh, in the process, if it's a tax favor favorable uh, regulation, taxpayer favorable regulation, it kind of goes away. But then, on the other hand, uh, we're losing revenue. So uh, it's something to think about. So, Barbara, I want to ask you about yes, this. I, I mean, I would come back to the importance of um, the Hill and Treasury partnering. Um, that's something that happened throughout the process of developing the legislation. It was uh, it, it was happening at the level of the uh, of the chairman and the secretary and the NEC director. It was happening at the at the staff level with the office of tax tax policy. And in my experience, that's something that that has um, that has long been part of the legislative process. Um, in, in, at times when people don't really realize it, and, and something that I remember back from my days um, in the in the late '90s on the on the Joint Committee staff, uh, where there were there were always folks from um, from Treasury as part of that as part of that as part of that process. It 
that uh, ensures that they are there as the legislation is being developed, that they have firsthand view as to what congressional intent is, um, as, as it's memorialized in the statute and the, and the legislation. I think it's appropriate for those, um, for those conversations to continue. Uh, but they are about what is on the written page. Absolutely. So, so Barbara, let me, let me just ask you, I just want to follow up on that and, and let Marty jump in. How far can this, this, this sort of informal process go in the absence of statutory language or legislative history? I mean, th that seems to be the question here. So if you have something that just wasn't clear at all in the, in the legislation, so after that, how far can you go? How, how much information? That's a matter of interpretation, and I would think that uh, if I was thinking about it from a regulatory perspective with a, with a treasury hat on it, I'd think about what was, um, if this was an issue that was not addressed, um, so a corner that was, not, uh, that was not addressed in the statute, what is the answer that's most consistent with the, um, with the, other, with the other parts of the statute, I mean, there's lots of there's lots of things that you bring to that uh, to that question um, that that are written on the page, um, and I and I think I, that that's that that's the exercise that Treasury goes through um, in issuing interpretive interpretive regulations, and part of that discussion may lead to identifying that there's a need for a technical correction, um, and so as uh, um, or. or to the extent possible, blue book, further explanation in the blue book or something like that. That's right, and, the, and the, 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 the blue book can provide additional color. The blue book is, is, not, um, uh, is not legislative history itself, and so all it can do is provide additional color, but it does in the form of, in the, in the form of more examples or just a little bit more, more explanation. It often does, as, as Dana pointed out in the 86 Act, I identify that a technical correction may be needed in this situation. Um, and um, technical corrections themselves are um, merely reflections of congressional intent. Um, and then there is potential for future refinement, um, which, um, which would be a change in the law. Marty, you want to jump in? I just want to make one point. Remember, the regulations aren't scored. So uh, when you're on the Hill and you pass a tax favorable statute, the, the estimators score it. When you write a tax favorable regulation, it just goes into the ether in terms of uh, fiscal, uh, the fiscal effects. Uh, oh, I just want to make one point. Uh, back in 86, maybe you remember this. After the conference committee met, we were drafting. Mm -hmm. After the conference committee met, we were drafting. And we were making... You know, I was at Treasury at the time. We were making very big decisions. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've seen very big decisions made post-markup. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're honest, I've seen discussions, uh, debate, uh, negotiations go on before the press release that describes what happens in markup. So, my, point, my point is, <laughs> just because I was in the room doesn't make me an authority on that particular provision. That, that's, that's true, and it is difficult to come to grips with the informal aspect of this. But, but wearing my uh, treasury hat for the moment, and I said this uh, earlier, you know, I want to talk to Barbara about it because she's another uh, smart tax person with lots of experience who was involved in the process. And I, I, don't, I don't think... Uh, the equivalent of me in Treasury is bound by what Barbara says, but they cannot help but be um, educated by, by that conversation, just like I would talk to any number of my peers about, um, you know, how Davis Polk is going to come out on opinion on the pass-throughs provisions. So Senate. you would disagree with Senator Hatch? I I found I found some I th I think the world of Senator Hatch and I, <laughs> and I think I mean, the world yes. of Don Lubick. I mean honestly I think uh, mm -hmm. there are there are people that I think a lot of over time and will always value, but um, on this one I think he was you know a little in front of his skis. Um, what what I do what I the way I would say where he's relevant is when they are a very important 
part of the interpreting what they do, but they need to put that down in the legislative history. That's how that process works. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to uh, mm -hmm. I want to give you all a chance to ask some questions. Mm -hmm. but I have one other issue that to, I want to ask each of you about very quickly. And there's there's now another player who may get involved in this, and that's the Office of Management and Budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's an interesting debate going on inside the administration about OMB's role, OIRA's role in this. Let me ask each of you two questions, and you can give me very short answers. First of all, does OMB have the legal authority to do this? And second of all, should it do it? Nathas Lilly first. She was in charge of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was not in charge of this. I thought you were going to discuss yes it. Yes and no. Oh, um, yeah, I, not in charge of this issue, but um, I, I tend to think it's an unwise move. I think... I would uh, defer to people who have thought more deeply about the legality, but I haven't seen anything suggesting that um, OIRA clearly cannot review tax regulations. Um, but I I'm not sure it makes any sense, and I would tend to lean towards the view that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, first, they, they don't have any tax experts on their staff right now. They could hire some. Um, they are going to hire some. But uh, I can show yeah. you the ads. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I responded to a couple you, of them. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <laughs> Just to check it out. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to know what their health plan was. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as yours. <laughs> so, um, you know, Treasury and IRS have decades and decades of experience on thinking through tax regulations and guidance. And... Um, OIRA doesn't. Um, they don't institutionally. And I, I'm just not sure what they would add to and the, the individual, process. And the individuals don't. Um, yeah. But the, the second thing I would add is um, I think this is going to slow the process. And I also think it raises really difficult conceptual issues for OIRA because um, taxes, generally OIRA doesn't count transfers as a social benefit. So mm -hmm. the whole thing is cost-benefit mm -hmm. analysis at OIRA. And uh, generally, if you take $1 from one person and give it to another, they treat that as a wash, even if the $1 is taken from a billionaire and is given to someone earning poverty-level wages. And the whole, one of the biggest purposes of tax policy is to take $1 and use it for a government social program that hopefully has a higher return uh, in terms of your social welfare analysis, to use an economics term. And that's just not something that OIRA has done historically. And so they need to sort of not only hire a bunch of tax experts, um, train up their managers who are not tax experts to supervise those tax experts, but they also have to sort of rethink the conceptual foundations of their analysis. And then the further thing I'm worried about is we started out talking about speed, that this is another roadblock in the regulatory process, that if it was going to really add something important, sure, add it. But I, I just, I don't yet see what is the important way that they will contribute to and improve regulations beyond the work that Treasury and IRS have historically done. Okay, Barbara, do you think that OIRA can serve a constructive I mean, purpose I think, here? I think the uh, OMB has um, always had a role in, in all regulations, including in, in um, tax regulations. Um, I think that's, it, it's an important role. The, the role that it played in, in tax regulations um, has has been um, different than it th than it does in some other regulations, and I and I guess I should say that with respect to to tax regulations, um, the most tax re tax regulations are interpretive. Um, there are only a couple of instances that I can think of of, of legislative regulations. The consolidated return regulations might be 385. legislative. Three eighty five. That equity. Uh, might be. That equity. Uh, but uh, but the um, and. and um, and, and so I think it's a natural that the role of, of OMB may be a little bit different with respect to, to tax regulations uh, than it is for other regulations. Uh, another thing, uh, another role that I can imagine that OMB plays in other regulatory spaces is when you have a regulation that has multiple agencies involved, mm -hmm. um, and that isn't the case uh, with respect to tax regulations. Most uh, tax regulations. So, so they don't need to be... be um, there doesn't need to be an arbiter sort of uh, balancing the interests of different agencies, although occasionally there, there are tax regulations that touch some other regulatory space, and I could imagine and, and believe that 
that, that someone that is overseeing that, that's an important role to play. Um, I think that the process has worked well with respect to regulations uh, that, uh, that, that, and, and it's important for that, uh, for that to continue. You've got to have the, the substantive expertise, uh, and then, and then there's sort of some big picture, um, 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 aspects that come in, um, and some of those come in through the OMB process. Great. Okay, we have about 15 minutes. I'd like to uh, give you all an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, please let us know. Wait for the microphone. Let us know your name, and please ask a question. Don't give a speech. Um, uh, yes, sir. Yes. Good morning. My name is Norman Evans, and perhaps my question might be a little more nuts and bolts than was intended by this forum. But my question is, can someone please comment on or explain what the IRS is doing with regard to withholding? Because it seems that before the new tax act, withholding was calculated according to the number of exemptions claimed. But now that there are no more exemptions, it seems the IRS is basing withholding on what is now called allowances. Each allowance, suspiciously, each allowance seems to be the same amount $4,150 that exemptions were going to be before the new act was put into place. So can someone comment on what determines the number of allowances a taxpayer is able to claim, and what is the best way to get guidance in this area? Barbara, you want to tackle that? I would make a couple of comments. So um, Treasury put out new withholding, withholding tables in January. Treasury puts out new withholding tables every year. Um, because even without legislative change, there are changes through inflation adjustments and elsewhere that require new withholding tables. The uh, withholding tables um, in the, the withholding tables key into the into the W fours that uh, the taxpayers file um, that historically have been based on the number of exemptions. Uh, uh, Treasury and the IRS worked uh, this year. Um, in order to avoid a situation that would require um, all employees and employers to to um, to immediately and at the same time file new w fours uh, they were able to take the the new system um, and um, adjust the withholding tables uh, to um, to align with the with the new system uh, and um, and then have indicated that they are continuing to work uh, to issue new W-4 forms um, for the future um, that will, that, that will um, make further, further adjustments um, into the future. Uh, the um, IRS long has had a withholding calculator on their website, uh, and they have just updated that withholding calculator, and I think the IRS has been quite vigilant in putting out um, fairly frequent notices in all different forums uh, to encourage people to look at the to, to use the withholding calculator on their on their website to check the withholding um, that to check what was effectively the reporting that they that that they had that someone had done on their W four. Uh, you have often have situations where someone's life um, circumstances may have changed. They may have had a child, or they may have had a child uh, graduate and and finally leave home, um, and they may not have, have remembered to adjust their withholding. Uh, and so the IRS has, I, th I thought, really taken seized the <coughs> opportunity of these changes to put out far and wide the information that people should be um, thinking about those adjustments. Other questions? Uh, let's let, give some, somebody else a chance. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, uh, Catherine Kauser, uh, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Um, so you've discussed a lot today the speed at which the bill came out. So in a perfect world, how long would it take to draft a tax bill that wouldn't raise as much uncertainty when released? The perfect tax bill. Marty, you want to you give us a guess of how long it should, it, it should take Congress to draft a tax bill? <laughs> Well, we know the history of the 86 Act. Um, in fact, it, it, with 202 technical I'm corrections. Gonna, I'm going to check that. I'm check that. <laughs> it's probably 204. But, but um, certainly more time and care was mm -hmm. taken before the 86 Act uh, to uh, make that legislation. And this, uh, I, th I certainly think you needed more time. Now, how much more time uh, is another question. 
Uh, but I would think there would, you do need public, I think vetting by the, having the private sector come in, not just on the general concepts, but on the specific details. Because tax law is about details, it's not about generalities. And have them coming in and vetting the process would have helped a great deal. And but there was just a, wasn't time. And it was an important part of the process um, that began with the, the first roots of, uh, of discussion of tax reform many years ago. It worked through the, the um, uh, discussion drafts that were put out um, um, on the House side. Both, uh, both tax rating committees had working group processes um, on tax reform that got lots of comments um, on the House side, there was the blueprint for tax reform that also generated a lot of comment. From whom? Um, and, uh, um, and from you, Marty, and uh, from many others. Um, and and uh, so all of, all of that was an important part of the process. I do think it's true that no matter how long legislation, one takes over legislation, there, there will be, one, there's always the need for regulatory guidance um, because that's an important part of the tax law, um, and there seems always to be um, to, to be the need for technical corrections and for further guidance in the blue book. The 86A. That's yeah, just one in, example. And in fairness, it, it seems that as an observer of this, it seems that no matter how long Congress it takes, there's that period just before the bill passes where it is a mad scramble, and uh, where 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 where. It's a very important comment. Uh, honestly, first of all, I want to. You really do have to get away from the narrative of six weeks because, in fact, much of the structure in the legislation, it doesn't mean that I think I like this, I like this process, so I'm, I'm not going to go all the way. But it is much longer a period of time than that. Much of the uh, drafting that I saw once I got uh, here in July 10th actually had been going on during the pendency of the uh, the Ryan Brady uh, uh, le legislative action. And, of course, there were uh, multiple drafts from the camp experience. And the other thing I would say, uh, you know, lobbyists are actually important mm -hmm. because you <laughs> become, uh, they're part of, you know, if you're an economist, you would look at it as part of the information system. Mm -hmm. It's only, only through them that you start to learn about a lot of the technical issues and the issues on the interface between tax law and, and, the, and, and real communities. And in fact, during the entire summer, um, there were people coming in assuming correctly that parts of camp were going to revi be revisited uh, in the repatriation aspects and other aspects and talking about those technical issues. So it really wasn't six weeks. Do I love the process that did occur? I don't happen to love it. But uh, it's not quite as extreme as people are making it out. And the, the other thing, the point that Howard made, when General Utilities was repealed, it, it was based upon a relatively short discussion. There had been academic discussion, but a relatively short discussion in Senate finance after a description uh, of what it meant by, by Roger Mintz. The Gucci Gulch article uh, book says that not a single Senate finance member knew what Mintz was talking about. And we are still sorting out exactly what the repeal of general utilities meant. So you, you always have this process where the last three to five weeks will be rushed and there will be um, collateral damage that comes from that three to five weeks. I think, I think it is fair to say that the not even ideal, a reasonable uh, timeline for a major, major tax reform is way, way, way longer than 50 days. Um, so, yes, there were discussion drafts, but there was never a discussion draft of the beat that raises over $100 billion. Mm -hmm. There was never a discussion draft of the pass-through provision that was introduced in the Senate with the special mm -hmm. asset test. And, it, and, and, and just, you know, just, just to, just to uh -huh, okay. you know, give an example that, you know, is maybe a little for personal experience. So this group of 13 tax professors that wrote this paper, and we thought we were going at lightning speed by after the Senate bill came out on November 9th, within a month, we got out a paper talking about all of the huge issues that I mean, the still second. rising. The Senate bill, and it had already passed the Senate within yeah. a month. 
then, after the conference agreement was released on December 15th, we got the revised paper out three days later, and it was passed four days later. So these were things that pointed out major revenue consequences of the bill, like all the, all the treatment of state and local tax deductions, mm -hmm. how the states might you know, try to have an end run around that. And in a normal process, you would have much longer. I mean, if we even just use Obamacare as a standard, which was criticized as being incredibly rushed, that was nine months from introduction to final passage. That gives a lot of time for people to give input on, you know, not just glitches, but I agree, lobbyists have a role in pointing out things that are unclear. So does the general public. So do uh, tax experts that don't have any skin in the game. And there just wasn't the time to get that feedback, let alone incorporate it, both in the legislation and I would also point out in the revenue estimates of the legislation. So it doesn't appear that JCT, and I, this is not anything to blame JCT about, incorporated the potentially vast revenue consequences of what state and local jurisdictions are doing. And if we had a longer process, they would have been able to see how real a strategy that was and incorporate that into the revenue estimates. Okay. One I, I, more just, I, just, I just want to emphasize oh, go ahead. that go ahead. the section one, uh, the pass through the deduction is an entirely new way of doing things. We have never before in the history of the income tax tried to separate wage income from capital income. And so it's not like another energy credit or something. It is a fundamental change, and I don't think we ever had a hearing on it, uh, you know, on, the, on this what was type that? of approach that was eventually implemented. Yes, sir. And you guys did a great job. All right. Uh, Thank you for very much for this informative discussion. Uh, my name is Jeff Krasny, and I, I, I guess I wanted to sort of follow up the, the responses um, from that previous question with respect to the fact that Barbara, both Barbara and Dana um, offered the idea that uh, the likelihood of a supplemental bill will occur uh, with respect to this, the, the overall comprehensive tax bill so my question with respect to the schedule then, knowing that the midterms are coming up um, in November and the likelihood that the tax bill was passed as a result of uh, political issues this, this past year, what is the likelihood that a supplemental bill will actually take place? And as a result, knowing that the midterms are in November, the likelihood that something is going to take place or or, or more information will, will, will occur between now and November. Well, Barbara, let's give you a crack at that. We're going to have a second tax bill this year. Um, I uh, certainly something that uh, that 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 is uh, that is being discussed. Uh, I think that uh, there are many who are part of the process that would say that uh, uh, they don't want to wait another 31 years before having more more tax reform. Um, that con continuing to refine the, the the tax code is something that uh, uh, that, that, that should be uh, that, that should be a constant focus. Uh, Lilia, again, I'll ask you: as, as a representative of the United States Senate, since you worked there, <laughs> there's obviously a lot of talk in the House about doing a, a, a second bill. Do you think there's any chance that the Senate's going to pass a, a, another tax bill this year? I think it's highly unlikely. So, um, I mean, I, first of all, just to clarify, there's, as we've discussed, a big difference between technical corrections and uh, second tax bills. So mm -hmm. technical corrections are things that don't score. They don't have revenue consequences. Um, you know, an example might be where the statute says multiply by two in one place and three in another place, and there's extensive legislative history that they meant to, and people that knew that, would, it would be very clear, but someone that reads the statute would get confused. Um, and that would have zero score. Um, so that kind of thing, I don't know if there'll be a technical corrections bill, but there's not going to be any um, score. Uh, something that does have a score, I do not see the Democrats signing on to something that's losing revenue. Um, so, uh, and it seems like a lot of the requests are for uh, revenue losing changes, not revenue gaining changes. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty unlikely. Marty, what do you think? Well, just remember, we need 60, you need 60 votes in the Senate. And so, uh, and it's an election year, so yeah. I'd say there's no chance. Then is there a chance? I'm skeptical. Okay. <laughs> okay. We are out of time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank uh, this terrific panel, Barbara, Lily, Marty, and Dana.
uh, for a really illuminating discussion of a very important issue. So thank you all very much. Thank a ve you, a very confusing discussion. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.